Okay, so this is lecture thir 32 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at is something called the normal equations, and we're going to get a little bit of exposure to something called the Levinson-Durbin algorithm. All right? So we saw in lecture 31, and I kind of glazed over it, sort of the, the, the reappearance, the reemergence of the lattice structure. And the lattice structure in terms of forward prediction, right? And backward prediction, and the associated error with respect to forward prediction and, and backward prediction. So we saw in the last class, we had first, second, third stages, all the way to the peep stage. And we saw that the top branch represented the forward prediction, and the bottom branch represented the backwards prediction, right? And each stage consists of this type of lattice structure. We have the reflection coefficients. And that we also saw that there was this beautiful relationship that related AM of Z with AM minus 1 of Z and BM of Z, as well as the reflection coefficient, and there was a delay in there as well for good measure. What we're going to look at is we, we will look at, okay, so we have the forward prediction error, this FP of Z. Each one of these Fs here produces the error associated with the linear prediction in the forward direction and in the backward direction. Now, what happens is, can we characterize this in the Z transform domain? And the answer is absolutely yes. FP of Z is equal to AP of Z times X of Z. So, the Z transform of X of N times the AP of Z gives you the forward prediction error. And so, how do you calculate AM of Z and BM of Z okay, from H of Z? So that, that's a good question because it's not readily realizable. So we saw in lecture 31, we saw when we talked about AR and MA and ARMA processes, we had H is equal to B Z over AZ. Now, how, how do we relate H of Z to these AP of Z's and the BP of Z's, right? The, like, what's a relationship? And the answer is, this is the process that you need to do. And this is that recursive thing that I was telling you guys about. So what happens is, suppose you start with the P stage. So let's say we go all the way to here, the P stage. Suppose we have AP of Z. So suppose we have all those AP values, right? Let that be equal to H of Z. Now, what we've got to do is recursively work backwards to get every other stage, right? A, P minus 1 of Z, A, P minus 2 of Z, A, P minus 3 of Z. And there's a systematic approach to all of this. It's this. So what happens is you have A, P of Z is equal. We let it equate. H of Z, then the kth reflection coefficient, Kp, is equal to AP of P. Okay, So that's the uh, AP coefficient um, of AP of Z. So what happens is we say, okay, that guy AP of P is equal to that reflection coefficient. Now we need to calculate BP of z. So what is the backwards, you know, backward prediction equations, right? And that's going to be equal to k is equal to 0 to p, a p complex conjugate, p minus k, z minus k. So what are we doing? We're doing this in reverse. So the a p of p, a p minus 1, a p minus 2, all the way to AP0, we're flipping it around, and what we're doing is we're delaying it by K minus 1, uh, sorry, Z minus 0, Z minus 1, Z minus 2, all the way to Z minus P. So we're literally taking the AP coefficients and we're flipping them around, and we're taking the complex conjugate to boot. All right? That will produce BP of Z. Okay. Then, how do you get 
AP minus 1 of Z. That's the pth minus 1 stage. You use this equation. You take the APZ minus the reflection coefficient at the case, uh, pth stage times BP of Z divided by 1 minus the magnitude square of KP. That will give you AP minus 1 of Z. Now, the reflection coefficient is equal to AP minus 1, A, uh, uh, P minus 1, so that coefficient in AP minus 1. And then you do the exact same equation as you did with BP of Z, and you just iterate down to the zeroth stage. That's how you get every one of those A, um, a set of coefficients, okay? As well as the B, the, so the, at every stage, the A and the B coefficients. Now, the question is, how do you get HZ from AM of Z and BM of Z? So, so it's, it's now the switcheroo. So we saw how we can get AM of Z and BM of Z from H of Z. How do we get H of Z from AM of Z and BM of Z? So it's the exact opposite. So what you do there, same sort of madness, what you do is you start with A0 of Z is equal to B0 of Z equals 1, and then you incrementally, using the equation we saw at the end of lecture 31, you slowly build up. Incrementally, first stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage, all the way to the P stage. And that will yield, ultimately, that, that guy. Now, what happens is, it turns out that the forward prediction error, if you take the mean squared value of the forward prediction error, so let's say we take the pth stage. So that is this guy here. So let's say we take the pth forward prediction error, and we take the mean squared. So this guy, if he's complex, we take the magnitude, so we take it and its complex conjugate, multiply them together, and what we do is we take the expectation of it. We take the average. That, it turns out, will be equal to the autocorrelation function of x when at, with itself. So it's like its variance, right? Plus 2 times the real of the summation of the APK complex conjugate multiplied with the autocorrelation function of x at value k, okay? And then this other stuff over here. It turns out that this guy here, this formulation, is actually a quadratic function of the prediction coefficients. So what you can then end up, it, it's actually really neat. What happens is from this, from this quadratic function of predictor coefficients, this yields linear a set of linear equations, which we call the normal equations. Because they're normal. No, because what happens is, is that for every, for every autocorrelation function of x, with, where two points are separated by L in time, it's going to be equal to the sum. So minus times the sum of AP of k multiplied by the autocorrelation function of x L minus K for L ranging from 1 to P. So this creates a system, in this case, creates a system of P equations, and the P equations consist of P unknowns. So we have P equations of P unknowns. We have a linear system of equations. Now we need to solve. And so how do we solve it? There are several techniques. So one is Levinson Durbin, which we'll talk about now. There's another one, which I'll leave it for reading for all of you in case you really want to fall asleep tonight, which is called the Sure algorithm. Sure. But what happens is, how do you solve for a set of linear equations with, uh, like, there are P of them and P unknowns? And so what we're going to talk about is that technique where you try and solve it. And again, this is more of a computer thing rather than brute force by hand. That's not going to be fun. Okay? So what you want to do is, you want to do, uh, in this case, we're going to look at Levinson-Durbin. Okay? And it has computational complexity of 
order p squared. So the b larger p, the complexity uh, grows with it uh, in the square relationship. So this is how Levinson-Durbin works. So Levinson-Durbin, you first of all form a matrix. And this matrix, okay, so the diagonal is always going to be gamma xx of 0. Write down the diagonal, the main diagonal. Then what you've got uh, on either side, the upper triangular portion and the lower triangular portion, um, as you move away, the index changes, right? You have like gamma xx1 all the way to gamma xxp minus 1, and likewise on the other side, except that the upper, upper right triangular portion is complex conjugate to the lower triangular portion down below. We call this a topless structure. <laughs> Sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Toplets structure. It's late at night. So what happens is this is a beautiful structure. Moreover, it has Hermitian properties. So it has this interesting relationship between the upper right and the lower left portions of this matrix. It's toplets and it's Hermitian. We're going to use that to our advantage. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to exploit the to toplets structure and we're going to do recursive just as before. So what we're going to do, okay? So this is the fun part. Yeah, I have a weird definition of fun. Is we're going to first of all start off with A11. So remember that we have P equations and each equation has P unknowns. So what we want to do is find out those unknowns. We want to find out the A coefficients, all of them, for all P equations, and each equation has all these P A, uh, you know, these P, P number of A coefficients. So let's start with the first one, A11. It turns out that that's going to be equal to minus gamma xx1 over gamma xx0. Okay. That's cool. How do we get that? The way we got that is we took the first equation, right? And what we did is we, we just kept it really, really super duper simple like. What we said is, okay, let's have the first equation. We say, let's only look at k equals 0 and k equals 1 case. So we got two terms. This is equal to 0. I have two terms. It's equal to 0. I bring one term onto the other side. I now start isolating for a11. We also make the assumption that a10 is equal to unity. This will simplify life quite a bit. So as a result, if we isolate a11, we get that first very important kernel for the rest of this recursive process. Now, we have this expression, right? This E1 of f. Remember that? That is our mean squared of the forward prediction error at p equals 1 stage. That will produce, okay, if we calculate it out, turns out that our forward prediction error, the mean squared uh, forward prediction error is equal to gamma xx of 0, 1 minus the magnitude squared of k1. Okay? If we solve this out. So now if we try and solve a21 and a22, that's the next equation down. So we're just progressively going down each equation, solving more and more coefficients as we progress. And we, we use a11 as a starting point. What we do is, first of all, again, just as before, so a21, gamma xx0, and a22, gamma xx conjugate 1, that's going to be equal to minus gamma xx of 1. So what we do here is, okay, we, we, we have this equation. We also have the other equation, right? So, so what happens is we can see that a211 gamma xx of 1 plus a22 gamma xx of 0 is equal to minus gamma xx of 2. So again, so that's, that's sort of the next step, right? And so what we want to do now is we are going to exploit a11 in all of this. What we're going to do 
is we're going to take these equations and we're going to manipulate them. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to somehow f f uh, factor in A11 into all of this. So let's say we take A22 here, right? So where is A22? Here and A22 is here. What we want to do is we say, okay, let's isolate for A22. So we take one of these expressions here, so we mathematically manipulate these two equations such that at the end of the day, what we end up getting is an expression for A22 and A21, and then we plug in, because we know what gamma xx of 1 and gamma xx of 0 is, and how they're related to A11. We isolate for either one of those gammas and plug it back in to the A21 and A22 expression, right? So what we do is we do a little bit of mathematical manipulation. So how do we do this? So what we can do is we can isolate. So right now what we have is we can isolate for A22, we can isolate for A21, and, and then we sort of put it on one side, and now what we want to do is we want to express everything in terms of A11, because we already solved what A11 is, right? So what we do is we replace one of the gammas. Gamma is known. The gammas are known. So what we do is we replace one of the gammas such that we get rid of the unknowns, which is A21 and A22. We isolate those such that we only have something totally in terms of known quantities, and that's what we get here and here, right? In fact, this expression, A22, we have gamma xx of 2, we also have A11, that's known, gamma xx of 1, that's known, E1f, that's known. Hey, so now we know what A22 is, plug that back in, we know what A11 is, A22, A11, bingo. We now know what A21 is equal to. And so we can progressively and recursively continue on until we make something called an nth order predictor, until we can find out all AM coefficients, right? And so we use AM minus 1 in order to create the AM case, and the DM is a scalar of the KM co uh, reflection coefficients. So how does this work? How does Levinson-Durbin work in this case? It's this matrix over here. So what we do is we have the upper left-hand portion of this gamma M matrix, we have that guy. What we then do is we incrementally add to the right and to the bottom of it the next step of gammas, right? And what we then do is we use that in, and use it for the normal equations. And from that, we now have, okay, we have AM that we want to get, and we have that DM minus 1, and the current KM, we have this beautiful matrix that this is the previous step. Here are the additional values to give us the current step. That's the current output. And if you solve these equations over and over and over again, so you have star and you have double star, these two guys, we can basically compute the next A's, from the previous A's using all those gammas. Okay? So you can plug these guys in, and at the same time, you can also solve for the reflection coefficients at every stage, right? So you can isolate for Km using double star, this guy over here, right? So here you have your Km, you have your gammas and, and such, and you have your double star. What you can do is you can isolate for Km with the double star, and now you have a closed form recursive expression to solve for the reflection coefficients in your lattice structure. Okay? So what Levinson-Durbin does is it progressively does this. It, it bootstraps from this very seemingly innocent looking expression, and then let's go to the next step. 
the next stage, and it gets a little bit more complicated, and then the next step, and the next step, and the next step, until we have a pattern where we can now create all the AMs, starting with A1, right? So this is how Levinson-Durbin creates, it solves all those P equations with P unknowns, starting with the first simple equation and then building out from there. Okay? And so what happens is, using this, we can create an FIR lattice filter using Levinson-Durbin, right? So this totally looks like a lattice. And what happens is, at the same time, every time we create a new error, right, the forward prediction uh, error, the mean squared of it, right, what happens is it's kind of interesting. Those prediction errors, like the mean squared prediction errors, they get progressively smaller the more stages we go down. Why? Our prediction's getting more accurate. We have more data. It makes sense, right? Every time we look at one more stage, one more stage, it's one more bit of information that we're adding, right? So we're, we're predicting better because we have more information from past history. That's why this, this, this expression here, these inequalities, at the P stage, you should have the smallest prediction error out of all stages, right? So again, we're not going to cover sure algorithm. So if you're interested, that's section 12.4.2. Also, check out section 12.5 because they're going to talk a little bit about the various properties of linear predictors, um, especially lists A through L on five, uh, 858 in your course textbook. All right. So with that, that concludes lecture 32. Okay.